Yo. Breakfast Club and especially talking about history and Viet- Vietnam history. My name is Todd DePastino. I'm the executive director of the Veterans Breakfast Club and have been for quite some time. But before I did that, I taught history. And one course that I taught was History 173, Vietnam in War and Peace. And I did that at Penn State and taught it for many years. And every year it was a little bit different. Every year I added on to it. I think that if I were to teach it again now, I would I would teach it very differently. Uh, I think a lot, especially, has come out uh, with young scholars doing a lot of work in the Vietnam War era, and um, it's been uh, illuminating. I've been trying to keep up on some of the research. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what I wish I knew more about. Uh, but what we've been doing is this is the fifth in a series of what I think will be six uh, lectures and conversations about the history of Vietnam, uh, not only during the war, but kind of the prehistory of the American War. And this is because the Veterans Breakfast Club, we're doing a trip to Vietnam. We're leaving one month from tomorrow, actually. Uh, 21 of us will be traveling from Hanoi and then go to Halong Bay and then all the way down, work our way down to Saigon and the Mekong Delta. For two weeks, we'll be traveling. And very much uh, look forward to the trip, of course. We have a wonderful in-country tour guide named Khan, who will be our guide uh, and our companion with us the entire way. Uh, Also, I'll be blabbing a lot along the way, (laughs) uh, sharing some history and stories as, uh, as, as I understand them. And then, of course, six of the 21 who will be traveling with us served in country uh, during the Vietnam War. So we are going to be in some cases, retracing their steps, and in all their cases, we're going to be certainly paying very close attention to what they're experiencing and what they're noticing about a country that uh, that they have, you know, indelible memories of from over 50 years ago. Uh, but this is the fifth, in a, as I said, in a series of six lectures. And my thought was to try and keep the lectures a, a little, I've been going a little bit longer than I I'd hoped I would. And I want to give more time to conversation, Q and A. You know, uh, I I learn a lot from talking with the veterans. I um, and from all of you who are familiar with the history of the Vietnam War and of Vietnam, and um, and, and I enjoy that conversation more than I enjoy just lecturing. So uh, I will. What I thought I would do tonight is a more conventional history. I think I said last time that the, you know the program wasn't so much about the march of events, it was more about concepts, important concepts, and deep patterns that were at work in Vietnam throughout the 20th century. Well, tonight is gonna to be more a march of events. It's gonna be this happened and then that happened and then this happened and then that happened. And, and it gets really confusing. I looked at my notes today and thought I would kind of streamline it a little bit and keep out some details that went, then we could follow up maybe in conversation after the presentation is over. I also thought I would restrict the the uh, lecture part of our program to um, to World War II and just really get into the beginning of what is called the First Indochina War or the French Indochina War, which began in 1946 and continued through 1954. Um, But of course, it was the events of World War II that set up the First Indochina War. So I thought we'd we'd really focus on uh, what happened in Vietnam in World War II, because man, it was darn A, tragic, and B, very, very complicated. So uh, let's get into it. Um, I will share my screen and uh, uh, go along with the photos. Again, you don't, you know, you don't need to see the slides necessarily to to follow the the um, the presentation, but I think it helps. And and one photo that 
you know, this is just kind of more color than anything instructional, is this very, very well-known photograph. I used to, every once in a while, just as a fun event, <laughs> this is my idea of fun as a professor, I would show this photograph and then have the students kind of say, why is this man, you know, answer the question, why is this man crying? This is like iconic photograph from 1940, uh, I always understood for years that I understood it was a photograph that was taken on June 14, 1940, when the German army marched into Paris and uh, you know took over Paris. Uh, the, 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 the French would eventually capitulate, I think, the following week. Uh, but this this I always understood was the fall of Paris in in June uh, June 14, 1940. I, I've since learned, I think, I think, that this is this was mislabeled. That this was not taken in Paris. It was rather taken in Marseille three months later, uh, when I think the French army, the Free French Army, departed Marseille and left for North Africa. That's that's my understanding. I, I I could be wrong about that. But the point is, is um, the fall of France in 1940. That the, the uh, German it's called the Blitzkrieg attack. The, uh, the the massive and, and surprising um, conquest of France in 1940 by Hitler's German army really transformed French Indochina, uh, I mean, almost overnight. This was a, a, a massive attack uh, that started in the low countries here and uh, made its way towards Paris. In six weeks, France was defeated. Within six weeks, Adolf Hitler is there posing in front of the Eiffel Tower. So this is a um, this transforms French Indochina because, as you as many of you know, uh, the French ended up signing a an agreement with Germany that uh, France would be permitted to keep a nominally independent country called I think the State of France or something like that, not a republic. Uh, in half of the country, and it was that this this government, this French government, was called the Vichy government because it was located in a city south of Paris called Vichy, and that was the capital. The northern part of France was occupied directly by the Germans, but for a while, at least the southern part. I'm sorry, I think I misstated that. The northern part of France was occupied by the Germans, but at least for a while, the southern part of France was was allowed to to maintain a semblance of autonomy under the Vichy French government. But what it meant now was that the Vichy French government was a collaborator with the Germans, with the Nazi Germans. So what that meant was that Indochina, a French colony, is now on the side of the Axis, officially, uh, rather than the Allies. And uh, so Japan, of course, immediately recognized <laughs> this opportunity. And, you know, what I would say to my students is, is Japan approached the French, the Japanese Imperial Army approached the French, and this is a vast oversimplification, but it, they truly did approach the French in June, probably even before that in May uh, 1940, and said, hey, we could do this the easy way or the hard way. The hard way is we go to war. The hard way is we conquer Vietnam and Indochina. Uh, the easy way is if we negotiate some kind of deal, kind of like what the Germans did in France, where you know the French could save face perhaps and have a collaborationist regime. They could administer the colony of French Indochina. They could continue to call it French Indochina. And we would just have permission to station troops in French Indochina, especially along the Chinese border and also rake off a lot of the material wealth, the surface wealth of French Indochina, the coal, the rice, the rubber, the tungsten, the tin, the zinc, and all those other raw materials that were so valuable to the French in the first place, and that um, would be valuable to the, to the Japanese war machine. Um, the French, after some negotiation, and it did take a few months finally to get a, a kind of a, a, a deal set, uh, chose the easy way <laughs> and collaborated with the Japanese. So during World War II, for most of World War II, uh, French Indochina, Vietnam was 
administered as a colony by both France and Japan together. Uh, At first, the Japanese kind of sent mm, 6,000 troops or so to North Vietnam because that was their main concern. And these are troops coming across the Chinese border. Their main concern was the the one reason that the Japanese really valued uh, French Indochina was not only because of the raw materials that could feed the Japanese war machine, but also because Japan was at war with China, with Chinese nationalist forces. And the Chinese nationalist forces were getting their supplies, most of their supplies, through Indochina, through Vietnam, uh, north across the border from Vietnam into southern China. And so the Japanese wanted to shut that off. They wanted to station five, 10,000 troops near the Chinese border to make sure that no supplies were going to Chiang Kai-shek's nationalist Chinese army, which would become a major ally of the United States and Great Britain and the Free French during World War II. Uh, So that was the initial uh, uh, approach um, of the Japanese. And here's more another another, um, uh, shot of Japanese soldiers this time walking across the border. And this is right on the border. You see uh, Dong Dang right there. That's the name of a little village right on the Chinese border. I'll show you where it is. Here's China to the north. This yellow country is Vietnam. You can see how it hugs the coastline of the South China Sea in the Gulf of Tonkin uh, to the east and the Anam, Anam mountain range runs to the west and separates Vietnam from Laos and Cambodia in the west. To the north is this really, really rugged territory. I mean, mountainous and rugged. I hear it's extremely beautiful, but it's still extremely remote. And every once in a while, every once in a while in the news, and I think it's been a while since I've heard this, but every once in a while in the news, you will hear the story of a large mammal being discovered by Western scientists for the first time ever. And often it's up here where they're discovered, like a deer species or a a rodent species, uh, you know, a, a, a mammal that you would think could not escape notice for thousands or hundreds of years, but it is so remote in these mountainous regions that, in fact, they, it, it can escape notice. In fact, that there were there were not, there were people who lived in these mountainous areas uh, until you know well well after World War II, well after World War, probably the 1970s. Uh, there were people who had never been in contact with uh, outsiders, had no contact with the outside world. These were uncontacted peoples. And some of them were still living in these remote mountains. So this is how remote and rugged the terrain is. Uh, the the Japanese landed troops in Haiphong and marched them to kind of guard the border here to protect the funneling of of um, of weapons and supplies to the Chinese nationalists. Uh, that was the goal. And eventually, the Japanese influence in Vietnam as as the war went on, and as soon after the, you know, the U.S. got involved in the war, um, the Japanese sent more troops to Vietnam. Eventually, they would send, oh, there would be probably 25, 30, 35,000 troops at any one time in French Indochina on the Japanese side. The Japanese would actually filter all the way down to the south and take over the entire country, again, mainly because of their hunger, rapacious, voracious hunger for the raw materials that French Indochina had to offer. And, you know, at first there was kind of like the Vietnamese kind of, um, there was kind of some hope. And this is a piece of Japanese propaganda here. Um, There was some kind of hope that, uh, that the Japanese presence in French Indochina would lead to Vietnamese independence. Maybe, maybe the Japanese Imperial Army would be a liberating force. 
that was an expectation of many Vietnamese people. This is a great, uh, here's a great uh, poster of a, a Japanese person, a Vietnamese person, and a French person, you know, three, three girls kind of uh, <laughs> doing this dance, and you see the flags in the background, you know, everybody's collaborating together, and we're one big happy family. That was the, that was the, what the Japanese wanted to project to the Vietnamese people. And there was some reason to believe that the Japanese might be a liberating force because the Japanese were the role model for every Asian country looking for independence from European colonization. The Japanese Every, all eyes were upon Japan. Japan was this remarkable story, this remarkable exception that had been a feudal system until 1853. Then uh, Matthew Perry in the five black ships forced the country to open up to the outside world. And Japan very rapidly modernized and industrialized and took its place or tried to take its place among the great powers of the world, the great powers of Europe. It defeated China in a war in the 1890s, and it defeated Russia in a war in 1904-1905, uh, uh, becoming the first Asian nation to defeat a European nation in a war. And this absolutely, this success, this remarkable success of Japan in kind of taking its place in the sun on the world stage, absolutely caught the notice of this man here on the left, Fan Boy Chow, who's still a household name today in Vietnam. He's the first, he was an intellectual, he was a political figure, uh, he was a revolutionary, and he was he's considered kind of the first modern Vietnamese nationalist. He wanted desperately the independence of Vietnam from the French. He was not a communist, uh, he was a nationalist through and through. And he, he he traveled to Japan to see how they did it. And he came back and said, Japan is our model. And so for a whole generation of Vietnamese nationalists had looked to Japan as their role model. And they were hoping that the arrival of the Japanese might mean the independence of Vietnam, maybe down the road. Uh, but of course, those that fantasy uh, was disabused pretty quickly as Japan proved to be as ruthless, if not more ruthless, or certainly more rapacious than the French had been. Uh, the Japan Japanese occupation of French Indochina was a catastrophe for the Vietnamese. It would eventually lead to the worst famine in Vietnam's history when some bad harvests combined with just, uh, uh, a, a, again, I'll just use the word term voracious, rapacious, um, kind of scraping off of rice from Japan to feed the Japanese Imperial Army, I mean, from Vietnam to feed the Japanese Imperial Army, could, created this famine that killed 2 million Vietnamese people in about six months in 1945. So this was a real catastrophe for the Vietnamese, uh, this is a French now propaganda poster, a free French propaganda poster, calling upon French men to come and uh, liberate Indochina from the, the Japanese dragon here that's choking Indochina. Uh, and, and the Vietnamese people would come to see fairly quickly that, uh, that Japan was no friend. In fact, it was quite a quite a foe. This is a dark time. I mean, 1940, 1941 is, is probably the darkest time in Vietnamese, uh, the 1940s, World War II, the darkest time in modern Vietnamese history. And, and so it's striking that um, Uncle Ho, Ho Chi Minh, uh, would decide that this would precisely be the time when he would return to Vietnam for the first time in 30 years. He had left, as you'll recall, uh, under an assumed name, became a cabin boy in a tramp steamer, uh, traveled to the United States, traveled to Euro London, Europe, landed in Paris, claimed to have studied under Escoffier as a pastry chef in London, I believe, claimed to have worked as a pastry chef at the Parker House Hotel in Boston, also another hotel, I believe, in New York City, uh, arrived in Paris, uh, changed his name again several times, and um, eventually became fairly well known 
in Paris as Nguyen I Quoc. And this is his photograph. Nguyen I Quoc, which means Nguyen the Patriot. And he began to agitate, this is by the 1920s, for the independence of Vietnam. And he was agitating for this independence while he was living in France as a member of the French Socialist Party. And then quickly saw that like the French socialists, they were tolerant of Nguyen I Quoc's, you know, constant hammering about colonization and the oppression of the Vietnamese people. They, you know, you could almost imagine these French socialists saying like, hey, we get it, guy, you know, but we've got other fish to fry. We've got other, you know, we're looking for a parliamentary majority here in, in France. We're, you know, we're not, we're not overly concerned about the fate of your people and French into China. And so because the French, the Japanese, the French um, socialists weren't terribly interested, uh, he turned to communism. He actually was the founder, one of the founders of the Communist Party of France and used that, his newfound communism and Leninism. Uh, Lenin wrote and spoke a lot about empire and about national liberation or liberation from capitalist uh, uh, colonies. And so Nguyen I Quoc found this home where he felt he could, he had this, there was this radical emphasis on um, decolonization and anti-colonialism that really fueled his communism. He would then travel for decades to Moscow, to China, back to Europe, back to Moscow, back to China. He'd get arrested, he'd get released, he'd get arrested again. He probably went through 200 different pseudonyms. And then finally, finally, 30 years after leaving Vietnam, he decided to come back. You know, there's a old saying that in every crisis, there's opportunity. That's absolutely what Ho Chi Minh saw. Absolutely. That the darkest time for Vietnam is the most auspicious time to launch a national independence movement. Uh, so he crossed that border, just like where near where the 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 Japanese uh, uh, came across, uh, across the border into Vietnam for the first time in 30 years. And I'm showing this map here. I don't know if Mary Klepper is with us, but uh, <laughs> Mary, Mary is is uh, I, I I just get this sense that Mary Mary's coming on our trip in in a month. And I think that after this talk, she would say, "Hey, can we go to Pak Bo, the, where 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 Ho Chi Minh came across the border?" And I just want to show her. It's a six and a half hour drive from Hanoi to Pak Bo, and really rugged terrain. This is it. This is where Ho Chi Minh came across Pak Bo, Cao Bang ta Town. Uh, he came across right here, and this is where he lived. You can visit it. This cave on the left. He moved into a cave. He had a cot. Uh, some of his compatriots had cots, and it was there that he launched his resistance movement to both the French and the Japanese. You could visit this cave. It has this historical marker here, and um, and it is you know considered a, a a national heritage site in Vietnam because this is where Uncle Ho decided to launch the Japanese or the Vietnamese independence movement. Now. Uncle Ho changed his name for the last time. If he had 200 different pseudonyms, the second to last was Muen I Quoc, which he kept for 30 years, so 20 years. Um, but then he decided to change his name once he crossed the border one more time. And he crossed it in January 1941. He changed his name finally to Ho Chi Minh, he who enlightens. And it's kind of, I, I don't, Quite, I know that the Vietnamese the naming conventions in Vietnam are quite complicated and extremely important because, as we've said before, there aren't that many last names in Vietnam. So, so first names have to really get your attention and first names have to be creative. And just like with many Native American tribes, uh, Vietnamese people historically have reserved the right to change their names uh, as their life progressed. So it was, it's not unusual for a Vietnamese person, say 100 years ago, to maybe run through three or four different names during the course of their life. Certainly, the milk name, the name that you're born with, is going to be different than the name that you have as an adult. 
Um, so this naming convention was quite common, but it's it's funny that Ho Chi Minh would name would rename himself from Nguyen the Patriot to Ho Chi Minh. Um, because Nguyen the Patriot was quite famous in Vietnam. Nobody quite knew exactly what he looked like or who he really was, uh, but he had done a lot of writing. He'd done a lot of propagandizing. He'd kind of made a name for himself over three decades uh, the, as this mysterious patriot who was promising to return and help deliver Vietnamese independence. So he crosses into Vietnam for the first time, changes his name to Ho Chi Minh, he who enlightens, and nobody really knew who Ho Chi Minh was. And so, uh, you know, he had to kind of clarify that this is now Nguyen I Quoc, this is his new name, Ho Chi Minh, and that a new era was beginning. And so it was in this cave in Pak Bo and in the Viet back that Ho Chi Minh met, I believe, for the first time, Vo Nguyen Jap, who's 20 years his junior, who would go on to become, the, you know, the great and famous general of the North Vietnamese army. He also met Fan Van Dong, who was one of his closest kind of lieutenants in the independence and the communist movement. Fan Van Dong was a communist. He was uh, had been a, a, a jailed, uh, he had served time in prison, just like Ho Chi Minh had. He had, uh, you know, been a revolutionary and radical. He had left the country and um, he would eventually become prime minister, one of the prime ministers of Vietnam, both during the war, of North Vietnam and then of the reunified Vietnam after the war was over. And it was there in the cave that the three of them really launched this movement that they called the League for the Independence of Vietnam. And this is significant. Uh, the Vietnam Doc Lap Dong Min. For short, you called it the Viet Minh, the Viet Minh. And the, you'll notice that there's nothing about communism in this title. And that was very deliberate, absolutely deliberate. Um, they were communists. All of them were. The three of them were communists. It was a communist, communist-led movement. However, um, they soft-pedaled the communism because of the world war. They were looking to gather the support of other Vietnamese non-communist nationalists, which they did, and also looking to emphasize their um, the, the the nationalist independence program part of what they were doing. Uh, you know, you might say that they were kind of nationalist first, communist second, uh, and they were betting on something big. You got to remember, Ho Chi Minh comes across the border back into Vietnam in January. I think it's actually January twenty eighth, nineteen forty one. It's a date that I think most Vietnamese people learn in school nowadays, January 28th, 1941. He comes across the border in 1941, early 1941, before Pearl Harbor. So the United States is not at war with Japan. Also before the German invasion of Russia. So Russia, the Soviet Union, is not in the war. This is remarkable. Ho Chi Minh is banking on that this war, which is so far fairly contained, is going to grow. It's going to grow to include the United States and an unlikely ally, the Soviet Union. That somehow the Soviet Union and the United States are going to both enter the war on the same side against Germany and against Japan. They will become allies. They will then connect with the Viet Minh, who will be on the ground fighting the Japanese. And then when the Soviet Union and the United States are victorious, they will recognize Vietnamese independence as reward for the Viet Minh's fidelity to the Allied cause. That's the gamble that Ho Chi Minh is taking. And it almost works. It comes really close. The US is brought into the war. The Soviet Union is brought into the war. These strange bedfellows do become important allies, and they do win the war. They defeat Japan and Germany in World War II. But that last bit, recognizing Vietnamese independence, that's what did not happen. But you could see, here are the Viet Minh. They are a small, at first, guerrilla force force 
living in remote sections of Vietnam, trying to stay out of the way of the French and the Japanese, except when they feel like they might be able to plant a mine or launch an ambush or assassinate a leader or steal some weapons or later steal some rice. These are really small cadre who don't are lightly armed, poorly trained. There aren't many of them, and they're more an irritation to the French and the Japanese than anything else. I mean, I, I don't know when, the, I would love to know actually, when the Japanese became aware of Ho Chi Minh and the Viet Minh. It may have taken a while for you know this small little band of ruffians out in the uh, you know out in the countryside to make their presence known. So they're small and they their their focus is as much on propaganda as on actual military operations against the Japanese because they know that they're you know they're not going to defeat the Japanese imperial army combined with the French in French Indochina. They're, what they're going to do is, over time, turn the Vietnamese people toward their movement. They're going to get the word out. There's a group called the Viet Minh. They are working for you. They're working for the country. They're preparing for the time when the war is over and Vietnam will be free and independent. So the Viet Minh, they were, during the famine, they, they, they gained enormous prestige during 1945 because the Viet Minh, that their, their job number one wasn't so much to fight the Japanese, but to steal Japanese rice and distribute it to the peasants. That's what they did. That kind of goodwill gesture to, you know, sell, sell the movement so that when the time was right, uh, the um, the Vietnamese people would get behind the movement. The Viet, Viet Minh caught the attention eventually. It took a while, it took years. But after a while, uh, the Viet Minh did finally catch the attention of the United States. The United States fighting, of course, in the Pacific theater. Uh, were looking for partisans on the ground in Asia, and they found, they ran across Vo Nguyen Jap and Ho Chi Minh. There's Ho Chi Minh right here, Vo Nguyen Jap right here. And you can see these are two Americans and that with some other Americans down here. And uh, they are OSS agents, Office of Strategic Services, the forerunner to the CIA. Uh, they, this intrepid team, I, I'm just amazed that anybody did this, think about this. They parachuted into Northern Vietnam and hooked up with Ho Chi Minh and Vo Nguyen Jap. And they stayed for several months and they trained the Viet Minh. They coordinated communications and, um, uh, you know, they, they handed over, coordinated the, the supplying of some weapons. You can see here's an OSS agent and Ho Chi Minh there uh, enjoying a drink. Um, the, uh, Ho Chi Minh became a agent, an OSS agent, agent number 19. I think his codename is Lucius. I think I could be wrong, but I think his codename was Lucius. And, um, and, you know, so he worked with the American OSS and coordinated activities with the OSS. So uh, Ho Chi Minh regularly reported on the weather for uh, allied operations in the air area. Also regularly reported on Japanese troop movements and, um, and helped to locate some downed American flyers in that rugged terrain in Northern Vietnam, Southern China. So Ho Chi Minh was seen as a you know very minor, but valuable contact in French Indochina. And Ho Chi Minh of course hoped that, that, that those contacts would pay off. Here's another, Photograph, and you can see here's an OSS agent right here, uh, training this pretty ragged band of, um, of Viet Minh. I mean, you can see this man here. He has a weapon, yes. He has that pith helmet, yes. But he does not have shoes. And neither does he. And neither does he. It looks like this man might have sandals. So this is, you know, these aren't, 
well-trained professional soldiers. These are rough guerrilla fighters, you know, who are who are just beginning to be part of this movement of fighting the Japanese. Um, eventually, of course, August, and you can see how I misspelled revolution. Uh, the um, the uh, the Japanese surrender eventually in August, mid August, nineteen forty five. And man, it is amazing how little time Ho Chi Minh and the Viet Minh wasted in declaring independence. And I mean, the bombs are dropped. The Soviet Union declares war on Japan. Um, the Japanese surrender. And like the next day, Ho Chi Minh is planning the declaration of independence of Vietnam because he knew, I mean, here was this underground movement that had been working in Vietnam for four years, but they didn't have public opinion polls. They didn't know how many people supported them. Uh, so the kind of the word was spread after the Japanese surrender. Um, here's a plastic time in Indochina. What's, you know, what's going to happen? I mean, it, the fighting has stopped. Japan is now going to have to give up Vietnam. And I should let you know, and I'll get to this in a little bit, uh, in the waning days of World War II, Japan no longer trusted France because France, of course, was liberated from the Germans. And so after France was liberated in, say, uh, you know, in, in early 1945, let's say, March 1945 or so, um, the Japanese decided to stage a coup and they took over all of French Indochina and jailed or imprisoned about 15,000 French troops. So the French are in prison. The Japanese are no longer really in charge. There's a power vacuum in French Indochina in mid-August 1945, and Ho is looking to fill that vacuum as quickly as possible. And to try to get some kind of a poll to see how much support the Viet Minh had and Ho Chi Minh had, he put out a call. He put out two calls, and I'm not quite sure why this was, but I think I, 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 think I know why. He, he put out a call in the South, go to Saigon if you can. walk bicycle, you know, uh, ride, row, get to Saigon for September 2nd, because there's going to be a major announcement and Ho Chi Minh's going to be there. Turns out Ho Chi Minh didn't go. Uh, because he also put out a call in the North, get to Hanoi. If you can send a family member, to, we, want a re we want a large audience, a large crowd in Hanoi for a special announcement on September 2nd, 1945. Well, the crowd shows up both places, but especially in Hanoi. We're talking about half a million people, 500,000 people assembling in what's known as Ba Din Square. We're going to be there on our trip. We're going to go to Ba Din Square. It's the largest public square in all of Vietnam, and it's still there. It is the center of an old uh, citadel of Hanoi, and it's where the Ho Chi Minh's mausoleum is today. And um, on September 2nd, you know, Viet Minh cadre uh, marched in, children marched in singing patriotic songs, uh, villagers, peasants marched in, tradesmen marched in. And then at the spot where Ho Chi Minh's mausoleum is today, in this rather hastily constructed platform, uh, Ho Chi Minh, who's this remote figure here behind a microphone, kind of tapped the mic <laughs> and read the Vietnamese Declaration of Independence. It is a day, September 2nd, 1945, that's still very much celebrated in Vietnam as the Independence Day. Uh, here's a close-up of Ho Chi Minh delivering his speech, the Declaration of Independence. Here is a uh, recent celebration of Independence Day, September 2nd, 1945. This is the Ho Chi Minh mausoleum right here. Here is where that podium was and Ho Chi Minh delivered the speech. Again, we'll see this. This is a, this is a hallowed spot. This is the one spot where you cannot take a picture. 
uh, you're not permitted to take a picture. In fact, I think we were, I think both trips, somebody took a picture and a guard came to say, hey, cool it, buddy, you know. So um, you're not supposed to take a picture of the, of the mausoleum. It's kind of, it's sacred ground. And what I thought I would do is read an excerpt. And this is only an excerpt. The, the document is not very long at all. But I thought I would read an excerpt from Ho Chi Minh's speech just to give you a sense of the flavor of it. And also the clear, very clear, unmistakable uh, sense that Ho Chi Minh was speaking to an American audience as much as he was a Vietnamese audience. Compatriots of the entire nation assembled. All people are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This immortal statement was made in the Declaration of Independence of the United States of America in 1776. In a broader sense, this means all the peoples on the earth are equal from birth. All the peoples have a right to live, to be happy and free. The Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen of the French Revolution made in 1791 also states, all men are born free and with equal rights and must always remain free and have equal rights. Those are undeniable truths, he goes on. Nevertheless, for more than 80 years, the French colonists in name of liberty, equality, and fraternity have violated our fatherland and oppressed our fellow citizens. They have acted contrary to the ideals of humanity and justice. For these reasons, we, the members of the provisional government representing the whole Vietnamese people, declare that from now on, we break off all relations of a colonial character with France. We are convinced that the allied nations, listen to this, which at Tehran, which was a site of a conference of the big three, Great Britain, Soviet Union, and the United States, which at Tehran and San Francisco, San Francisco was the conference that founded the United Nations in 1945. We are convinced that the allied nations, at which, which at Tehran and San Francisco, have acknowledged the principles of self-determination and equality of nations, will not refuse to acknowledge the independence of Vietnam. A people who have courageously opposed French domination for more than 80 years, a people who have fought side by side with the allies against the fascist during these last years, such a people must be free and independent. Vietnam has the right to be free and independent country. And in fact, it is already. And thus the entire Vietnamese people are determined to mobilize all their physical and mental strength to sacrifice their lives and property in order to safeguard their independence and liberty. This is an excerpt from the Declaration of Independence that Ho Chi Minh read in Baden Square, Hanoi on September 2nd, 1945, in front of a half million people. While he was reading it or after he was reading it or before he was reading it, an American, I think it was a P-38, swooped down and flew over the crowd in kind of celebration. It was a flyover to kind of celebrate. It was an OSS directed flyover to celebrate the independence and support. I think the independence of Ho Chi Minh and the Viet Minh. Uh, in the coming months, Ho Chi Minh would form a government. They would draft a constitution. They would hold elections in January, 1946 for the first time. Certainly the communists were elected to parliament, but also there were non-communists, plenty of them also elected and there were I can't say that they were free and fair elections but there were you know 90 percent participation rate in these elections certainly in the north uh there were men and women elected to parliament there were uh members of different nationalist non-communist parties elected to parliament and and the government that Ho Chi Minh and here he is Ho Ho's is, is president of this new country and this is his first cabinet here you can see a, a fairly diverse crowd, especially this man in traditional Vietnamese dress. Um, Ho's government in 1946 certainly was socialist. I mean, there was some land reform there. There was the eight-hour day. There was women's rights. There was universal suffrage. Uh, 
uh, but it wasn't communist, nothing like Soviet style or what would later be Mao style communism. It was it was a moderate, we would call maybe now in retrospect, a moderate socialist government that did look to include non-communist, non-socialists in the government. Now, this, this in part was Ho Chi Minh's uh, cunning, his savvy, uh, you know, wanting to build the strength of the nation. Um, it also, he, he tended to be a moderate in such programs, such communist programs. It was also, I have to say, a, a direct response to the occupation of North Vietnam by China. After the Japanese surrender, Chiang Kai-shek's national, Chinese nationalist army declared that they would, on behalf of all the allies, the United States, Great Britain, the Soviet Union, that Chiang Kai-shek's Chinese nationalist army would occupy North Vietnam and accept the surrender of the Japanese. <laughs> uh, we're talking 180,000 troops, 180,000 hungry, barefoot Chinese nationalist soldiers. Whatever the Japanese had not taken, the Chinese did. And Chiang Kai-shek was a nationalist. And then, of course, he was opposed to the communist Mao Zedong. And so uh, this is Chiang Kai-shek's clearly trying to kind of quell any kind of link up between Ho Chi Minh and Mao Zedong, uh, trying to keep Vietnam uh, non-communist. And so absolutely Ho Chi Minh felt the heat of that and cut a deal with Chiang Kai-shek that he'll have this inclusive government that won't be communist in the North. And he did. Uh, in the South, very different. This is always a perennial problem, and it's one that I wish I knew a little bit more about. Um, Vietnam is a hard country to keep together because it's so long. It stretches out so long north to south and it gets so narrow here at the waist, you know, 35 miles or so. Um, and, and so there's a, often a disconnect between what's happening in the north, which is the old, as we've said, cradle of Vietnamese civilization, and what's happening in the south, which is more which is newer, more modern, more cosmopolitan, more multinational, multi-ethnic, uh, uh, um, more diverse, much more diverse than the North is. In the South, there were, the, the, the Vietnamese people were more fractured. In the North, they were united around the Viet Minh. They were not so in the South. In the South, you had these factions that fought each other. It was diverse. And those who were loyal to the Viet Minh in the South, they were very radical and very communist. Here's what I wish I understood better and I would like to learn more about. There seems to be this trend in Vietnam over time that the communists in the South, and I'm talking the Viet Cong, the National Liberation Front, the NLF, are much more radical and much more communist than the NVA or the North Vietnamese are during the American War. There is a lot of tension and a lot of fighting between the Viet Cong in the South and the NVA in the North, or the national government of North Vietnam in the North, which tends to be more careful you might say more conservative, more moderate, but not so in the South, man. These radicals, these Viet Cong, they're insurgents, they're very radical. And in 1945, 1946, they began to have street fights with every non-communist group and some communist groups. They didn't. There were Trotskyites. There were Vietnamese Trotskyites who opposed the Viet Minh. And, you know, the, the, the Viet Minh would assassinate and execute and slaughter uh, anybody who opposed the Viet Minh in the South. So the South was kind of chaos, and Ho Chi Minh just could not extend that much control over the South. He tried, he tried to unify them, he tried to kind of tamp down the violence, but was pretty much unsuccessful. 
And while the Chinese had been assigned or took it upon themselves to occupy the north of Vietnam and accept the Japanese surrender to the north, the British took it upon themselves to land in south, southern Vietnam and accept the Japanese surrender in the south. On September, I think it was 11th, 1945, Major General Douglas Gracie, a veteran of the Pacific War, lands with 20,000 British troops in South Vietnam, and his mission is twofold. Number one, to accept the surrender of the Japanese. There are maybe 35,000 at most Japanese soldiers in Vietnam. Many of them are in the South. And so uh, Gracie uh, sets up a series of surrenders where, and here is one of them where you, you see that this must be a naval officer um, accepting the surrender of a Japanese soldier who puts down a ceremonial sword there. Here are Japanese soldiers. You can see they're bent over, and that's because they're laying down their weapons. They're laying their weapons on the ground in a ceremony uh, showing the surrender. So that's what the British are there to do, to accept the Japanese surrender and then collect the Japanese and repatriate them back to Japan. That's number one. Number two, the British job is to go and find those French POWs and liberate them, <laughs> bring them out, uh, you know, release them from captivity, but also put them back in charge of French Indochina. And this is the key to the British presence in South Vietnam uh, or in Southern Vietnam, in Vietnam in general. The British, and by the way, this is, Douglas Gracie here on the right, uh, doing some kind of handover of authority to, I think it's Colonel Philippe, maybe it was a general, Philippe Leclerc, who arrives in French Indochina and becomes the head of the French army in Indochina in 1945, 1946. So here's, here's the British, here's what the British wanted. The British did not like Ho Chi Minh and the Viet Minh. If they recognized Vietnam's independence, that would jeopardize British colonies. Winston Churchill had been worried about this from the get-go. Uh, this whole talk about self-determination and the Atlantic Charter and the independent the decolonization and all, all that kind of stuff that Franklin Roosevelt was very, very keen on during World War II. Winston Churchill is not keen on any of that at all. Winston Churchill wants to keep the British Empire together after the war. And so he knows that, you know, if if, if Britain supports in an independent Vietnam and France loses its colony, then what's going to happen to British India? What's going to happen to British Malaya? You know, uh, is, is Britain going to have to give up its colonies also? Is it going to encourage insurgencies in India and Malaysia? You know, this is all very much at the very top of the British mind and of Douglas Gracie's mind. And so when he arrives to the chaos in Saigon, the first thing that he wants to do is get the French out of prison, give them arms and have them take over the post offices, the custom houses, the administrative buildings of the, of, of the government that the Viet Minh have temporarily taken over. The Viet Minh have, have taken over most of these offices here in the South. Certainly, they, they've not quite formalized the system the way they did in the North, but they've, they have the balance of power in the South, and the Japanese are just letting them do it. Douglas Gracie releases the, the French, arms them, uh, and then instructs them to take over, take their colony back. The French are not able to do it. There is fighting in the streets between the Viet Minh and the French. So Gracie, with his 20,000 troops, they begin to join the fight. They begin to join the fight. And then this remarkable thing happens, and it doesn't take long. I think it's October 1945. The British, Douglas Gracie, gives the order to rearm the Japanese. The Japanese had been disarmed. They had surrendered. Here's a photograph. You can see an armed Japanese soldier here in the background saluting a French commando walking down the street. 
the British rearmed the Japanese, and this would go down in Cold War lore, as you could imagine. The communists made a lot of this. Uh, the British rearmed the Japanese, and together, the British, the French, and the Japanese fought the Viet Minh to take back Vietnam for the French. I, I, I wish I knew more about this episode. I especially wish I knew more about what the Japanese thought of all this. My understanding is they weren't too keen on this. They, they had fought a war. They had lost. Uh, they were not keen on fighting for the French to get their colony back. Uh, but Gracie did threaten them. There was no choice. They had to uh, join the fight. And they did. And so for months, for six months, there was a war in the South, an insurgency in the South. <laughs> the um i think the british i think it goes down in the books as 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 the british indochina war maybe uh the vietnamese know it as the war of southern resistance a 6 month war that takes place between september 1945 and march 1946 by march the insurgency had been had been quelled enough that the british uh, felt that they could leave. Uh, the French had been reinforced by French troops fresh from France. And this is really the beginning, March 1946, of what we call the first Indochina War, of the war between the French trying to retake their colony of Vietnam and the Viet Minh, led by Ho Chi Minh, trying to uh, achieve Vietnamese independence from the French. Here's another example of Japanese soldiers armed, lined up behind some British officers working together. These are, I think these are Indian troops, Gurkha troops, Indian troops, I think British Indian troops who have captured Vietnamese, Viet Minh weapons and flags and so forth. So these are all products here of this insurgency, the six month war that takes place in 1945, 1946. I thought I would take a moment here to talk about this handsome man, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Peter Dewey. What an interesting person he was. Grew up in Chicago, very politically connected family. I think a descendant of Admiral Dewey, Matthew Dewey. I think also a, um, I think he was related to Thomas Dewey, who was the Republican nominee for president in 1944. Um, yeah, 44, right? Yeah, 44. And also, yeah, and I think he also ran in 48 against Truman. Yeah, Thomas Dewey uh, uh, from a governor of New York. Uh, Peter Dewey was related. Peter Dewey was a OSS agent and uh, lieutenant colonel. Uh, Dewey arrived in southern Vietnam, in Saigon, in September 1945 with a small team of OSS agents. And he immediately saw what Gracie, Douglas Gracie and the British were up to. And he was furious about it. He was a supporter as the OSS very much was. The OSS was very intertwined with Ho Chi Minh and the Viet Minh. The OSS very much supported the independence of Vietnam. And so Dewey quickly came to blows with Douglas Gracie and the British and kind of did what he could to support the Viet Minh side of this insurgency. Kind of crazy. Uh, Dewey was in a Jeep. <clears throat> he was traveling near Tonsonut Airfield, as it was called at the time. And some Viet Minh, I think they had a machine gun nest. The Jeep was unmarked. It was not an American Jeep. They, uh, they thought it was British. They opened fire and they killed Peter Dewey. This is in September. 1945. He's the first American to be killed in Vietnam. His name is not on the wall uh, because the wall is for those who died since 1955, I believe. Yeah, 1955 is the first name. Peter Dewey is considered a World War II casualty, uh, but he, I think he should also be considered a Vietnam War casualty. He was the first, it was an accidental. It was an accident. He was a, he was not the target, uh, but he was, uh, you know, was was killed anyhow. And his last transmission back to the United States, back to headquarters at OSS, is Cochin China, which is the term for the southern part of Vietnam. Cochin China is burning. The French and British are finished here. 
and we ought to clear out of Southeast Asia. <clears throat> Peter Dewey, first to die in the Vietnam War. Uh, after Dewey's death, after the uh, British depart, after the Japanese are repatriated back to Japan, the French start landing in Vietnam in large numbers to take their colony back over. And as this is happening on the eve of this, when this is just about to happen, uh, on February 28th, 1946, Ho Chi Minh composes a telegram and sends it to President Harry S. Truman. This is what he writes. President Ho Chi Minh, Vietnam, Democratic Republic, Hanoi, to the President of the United States of America, Washington, D.C. On behalf of Vietnam government and people, I beg to inform you that in course of conversations between Vietnam government and French representatives, the latter require the cessation of Cochin China and the return of French troops in Hanoi. Stop. Meanwhile, French population and troops are making active preparations for a coup de main in Hanoi and for military aggression. Stop. I therefore most earnestly appeal to you personally and to the American people to interfere urgently in support of our independence and help making the negotiations more in keeping with the principles of the Atlantic and San Francisco charters. Respectfully, Ho Chi Minh. Telegram sent to Harry Truman. There's no evidence that Truman ever read it. Uh, but certainly, even if he had, he would have discarded it immediately. This is Harry Truman on the left, his Secretary of State, Dean Acheson, on the right. And they had already decided that they needed to give France whatever France needed to get back on its feet. France had been devastated by World War II, devastated, so much so that, you know, there are hungry people, starving people, homeless people, poor people in France, you know, as late as 1946. In fact, the situation in France was so bad in 1946 that the Communist Party of France, a political party founded in part by Ho Chi Minh, achieved almost a majority in the French parliament. I believe they achieved a plurality, maybe 46%, something like that. In other words, there is a danger of France falling into the Soviet orbit through the vote through a parliamentary process. The Soviet Union, in fact, is making overtures to France. Hey, we'll help you out. Hey, we'll give you our version of what would become the Marshall Plan. Hey, come within our orbit, you know, uh, come to our side and, you know, we'll get back on our feet together kind of thing. And Truman and Acheson by this time had decided that Western Europe, Europe, was the priority for the United States, that the Soviet Union, as it was aggressively expanding into Eastern Europe and had uh, put up what Winston Churchill would call the Iron Curtain here, where the red countries meet the blue and the white, that, um, that, that Western Europe would have to be built up to withstand Soviet aggression, that there would have to be a counter pressure against the Soviets in Western Europe. And they even came to, you know, Truman came to this heretical idea that maybe even Germany should be rearmed. I mean, West Germany, like, you know, we need a, we need a strong power in Central Europe. France did absolutely not want a strong Germany, of course, because it had been invaded three times in the, you know, previous century. Um, but what they asked from the United States was give us everything we need to counter, this is a, representing these arrows, representing the Soviet threat, the Soviet force, Soviet pushing into Western Europe, give us everything we need to push back against the Soviets. If you don't, if we don't have a prosperous economy, capitalist economy, that can support and feed and clothe and house the French people, then the French people might turn to the communists. So to have a prosperous capitalist economy in France, we need, as French people, our colonies, Vietnam. Harry Truman heard that plea and he blessed it. He blessed the war 
the first Indochina war. Officially, for a while, the U.S. remained neutral in this war. Uh, we certainly did not support Vietnamese independence, but we weren't giving a lot of aid and comfort to the French. By 1950, we were. In 1950, we began to support uh, the French in their effort to take back uh, Indochina. And by the end of the war, the U.S. was financing 80% of the of the French effort in Indochina. So that's where I'm going to stop. I, I had promised that I would keep this shorter, and I see that I did not live up to my promise. I, I broke my promise. I continued to talk. So um, let's let's take some time and uh, and have you uh, ask questions, make comments, make corrections. Um, I'll look here in the chat. You can feel free to wave your hand or to put the yellow Zoom hand up, and I'll make sure to ask you to unmute. Um, let's see. Uh, Carol Popchok, absolutely. So many echoes of familiar American themes in Ho Chi Minh's speech. Yeah, Ho Chi Minh was absolutely appealing to the OSS. I think he was hoping that those OSS agents who were there in the audience, and they were there in the crowd, would report back and say, hey, we have a friend at Hanoi. Hi, Nancy. Hi. Um one thing I don't really get is how Ho Chi Minh was able to just sort of declare, I'm, you know, I'm the president, there's this new government, and take over without a lot of other people saying they wanted their turn to. You know, just like how many people showed up in Philadelphia in May 1787 and declared that they were going to create a new nation and draft a constitution uh and and you know created this process for ratification it's it's really it, it's um it's a puzzle how nations are founded it's a puzzle how states and governments are created usually it's kind of the you know one thing that helps is to be first to take the initiative there's a power vacuum. This is what this is why Alexander Hamilton is such an important figure in our history. Uh, he was the first to see that after the American Revolution, there was really a power vacuum. That 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 no one state was powerful enough to you know keep the thirteen states together, this confederation together, and so he seized a moment in 1787 and you know got this uh, constitutional convention together to really scrap what had been the United States and reform it. And that's kind of what I think Ho Chi Minh did is, and that's why he wanted the big crowd is, you know, it, having a big crowd in front of him when he's declaring independence is kind of the equivalent of having a referendum. You know, there wasn't the infrastructure to hold a vote or anything like that. So kind of he wanted to build momentum uh, get clear popular support around his movement, and then just declare it. You, you know, declare that you're in charge, create a process where you can draft a constitution, get it approved, get it ratified, and hold elections. So think, you know, the uh, the Declaration of Independence was September 2nd. The elections were held, I think, the first week of January. So that's pretty fast. In other mm -hmm. words, he knew that there had to be this this uh, legitimacy, you know, there had to be a kind of a ratification process and the elections were part of it. Does that answer your question or no? Yeah, yeah, that that makes sense. I mean, he he was organized enough to jump into the fray with a lot of power, a lot of support. You know what? I, I found a way to say that in about 10,000 more words. So thank you, Nancy. You're exactly right. That's it. He was he was he, he jumped into the fray. Richard Berliner, good to see you. Uh, thank you. Tony. great presentation. Filled a lot of holes in in my knowledge. I heard you say there were two hundred thousand troops under Chiang Kai Shek entering and take over Vietnam, and I didn't hear you say what happened to him. <laughs> Oh, okay. Wonderful question. And I should say, let people know, Richard Berliner, uh, a member of the International Voluntary Services, served in Vietnam as an IVS volunteer in the 1960s, has a book coming out next spring. We're going to have him come and, and share his story about his time in Vietnam. Yeah, this is a complicated story. 
180,000, 200,000 Chinese troops in North Vietnam. This was a potential disaster. I mean, Ho Chi Minh would later say, we were the big threat of 1945 was from China, not from France. France, I mean, they've only been around a century. China, last time they came, they were here for a thousand years. Uh, he eventually cut a deal, and this almost toppled Ho Chi Minh from power, power. And this is getting deep in the weeds here. But in early 1946, Ho Chi Minh met with the French to negotiate. And one of the things that he wanted was to get the French to approach the Chinese and ask the Chinese to leave. The French said that they would do it. They would put pressure via the United States and Great Britain on China to get China to vacate Vietnam under the condition that Ho Chi Minh allowed the French to land 15,000 troops in Haiphong and occupy North Vietnam. Ho Chi Minh made that deal. Wow. And it was extremely unpopular, as you can imagine. Extremely. It almost cost Ho Chi Minh his leadership of the country. I mean, it, he was seen as a traitor, that he had clearly been a traitor. He had, been sold, he had sold out to the French. He would later explain it as this, and you will excuse, I'm going to use the exact language he used. And so you'll excuse it, but this is how you, you know, describe things to peasants. He said, um, and Andy Glade knows what I'm going to say. He said, to explain his decision, uh, I would rather sniff French shit than eat Chinese shit for a lifetime. I'd rather sniff French shit for a day than eat Chinese shit for a lifetime. I think that's how he's put it. You know, that kind of earthy, peasant, colorful language. That's how the Chinese went back across the border. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Richard. Anybody else comment? Oh, here we go. Nancy, how are you? Nancy Cochran, also coming on our trip in one month. Please do unmute. Uh, thank you so much. I, I'm just so enamored of the discussion this evening. And I think one of the things that really uh, surprised me, but doesn't surprise me, is the role of the British uh, when they came on the scene. And uh, they were thinking of their own selfish uh, colonial interests. And so, you know, they couldn't allow this to be successful. Uh, but two other things before that I wanted to share is that I've, I've uh, in preparation for leaving uh, for Vietnam, I've, I've read a lot about Ho Chi Minh. And uh, I love the fact that, you know, for all those years, his people often did call him Uncle Ho. And uh, that, that obviously is a term of endearment. But um, early on, um, he greatly admired the Bolshevik Revolution when he was in France, and that tells us a lot. And then also at one point in the 40s, I remember reading that for 18 months, he was in prison uh, by uh, China's anti-communist forces. And uh, that must affected his, his thinking and his planning considerably as well. Yeah, I think um, in 1930, he spent time in Hong Kong prison. He was going to be maybe repatriated to France. I can't quite remember the details of what happened. He probably uh -huh. spent other time in prison. Uh -huh. Ho Chi Minh is such a mystery. He's such a cipher. It's so hard mm -hmm. to figure out, you know, so much about what he was thinking, what he really thought, what, you know, what he really believed. And it clearly is that he was a flexible person. <laughs> he. Um, he said different things to different people. He spoke differently to peasants than he did to his fellow communists. He, when he wanted to portray himself as a nationalist and to the Americans, he could do so. When he wanted to uh, portray himself as a diehard communist to Joseph Stalin, he would do so. He sent that telegram that he sent to Harry Truman, he sent a very similar one to Joseph Stalin. So, you know, he's playing both sides here because he knows 
Vietnam as a small country is never going to be able to uh, remain independent without a powerful backer that hopefully won't ask too much of him. Uh, he was yeah. always, he even, you know, Vietnam today has this very uneasy relationship, to put it uh, mildly, with China. Because they know China protects Vietnam on the one hand, but on the other hand, that protection might be smothering. And so uh, that was always something that that Ho Chi Minh uh, kept, you know, kept in mind to kind of keep your friends at bay. Um, That was one of the things that he tried to do. Yeah, I I um, I I actually feel sympathy uh, for him in many ways. Uh, and I don't want to offend anybody, um, but he loved his country and he wanted what was best for his country, I honestly believe. And um, I think he enjoyed that relationship with the uh, OSS people and he enjoyed the relationship with America. And it was probably quite a shock to him when the British arrived and did what they did. I think he would have given anything to have a alliance with the United States. I, I, I do. I agree. I absolutely do. I because he was, um, you know, by the time that Ho Chi Minh came across the border in 1941, I, I can't say he was quite a, you know, totally on the outs with his fellow communists in China and with the Soviet Union. But they didn't trust him entirely because they suspected that at heart he was really a nationalist, that like he was just paying lip service to communism because they would support Vietnamese independence. Um, but of course, nationalists suspected that he was really at heart a communist. And so that debate continues to go on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, I I so wish, as we all do, that the Vietnam War had never occurred. Yeah. And, and um, all those tremendous losses um, you know, if, if, if only we, we had played a different role and the British hadn't played the role they had played and if only, if only, if only. If only, um, if only, if only. You know, yeah. I used to do, Nancy, I used to do this exercise with my students where um, I would give them the options that Harry Truman had in 1945 after laying out what, you know, what his, the geopolitical situation across the globe was, and what um, what his priorities were. Um, and you know, it's interesting, if we had a class of 30 students, I would ask, I would go around after the end of the exercise, and it would take a couple hours to get through it. At least three quarters of the students would say, you know what, you lay it out that way, I would make the same choice that Harry Truman made. That, that, that Fr- losing France was really a, a, a dire possibility in 1946 and that he was, you know, he would weigh what's more important to the U S France or Vietnam. I mean, there was no, there was no comparison. France was, yeah. France was going to have to get whatever they wanted. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I understand that. Yep. And that's the kind of tragic nature of the moment of 45, 46. Yeah. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Let's see. Anybody else? Well, here we go. Bob Mizwa and Andy. Did you raise your hand? Okay. I can remember my senior year in a political science class. My favorite professor, Dr. Alan Lee, said, uh, "Remember, international politics is totally Machiavellian." He there said, "Don't hold your closest ally." close enough that you can't stab him in the back later on. And yes. it is, you know, do not equate United States politics to international politics. A lot of these treaties aren't worth the paper that they're written on. And and okay. don't, yeah, and don't equate alliances between countries to friendships between people. <laughs> friendships, I think, can withstand serious differences. Not so in international politics. Yeah, it's just, it's sad, but it's 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 fact, you know. Uh, I, I, I mean, you know, let's face it, you know, in World War II, the, the, those dirty Japs and those dirty Germans, and what are we doing now? Oh, they're our closest allies. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. That's, that, that's an ideal picture of the Machiavellian aspect of international politics. So, yep. You know, here we are trying to second guess, you know, what's going through Harry Truman's mind. And, you know, he's playing a game in the, you know, according to, what's his name, Machiavelli. Yeah, <laughs> Machiavellian game. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, this is so dark. The whole story is so darn confusing because there is, there is this doubling back, you know, allies then become adversaries. Andy Glade, he's also going on our trip. How are you, Andy? Very good, thank you. Do you have um, your um, vaccines? I took the pills. <laughs> and, Do you uh, have your Vietnamese dong? Uh, I have not gotten Vietnamese dong yet. Either have I, either have I. And one of our travelers told me that she couldn't get them at the bank and she couldn't get them at AAA. I haven't tried yet. I'm going to go on tomorrow, I think, to PNC Bank and see if I could order some, just a little bit of Vietnamese money to take with me. How much money do you intend to take? About $300 worth at most, at most. Millions of dong. Yeah, millions. <laughs> and um, uh, and you could exchange it more cheaply, you know, in country, but it's, you know, it's nice to have with you when we go. But anyhow, what were you going to say? I'm sorry to derail you there. An observation or a question. Uh, I thought that the British Empire had the more, shall we say, valuable countries with minerals, etc. And the French got second rate. How much money did the French really get out of Vietnam? Or was this more pride? Um, question. Because question. truthfully, if America was going to offer... French support to counter Russia, Vietnam was a long way away from any value to France. Such a good question. Andy, I share that, but I don't have an answer for it. Um, in the reading that I've done, the emphasis on French colonization in Vietnam is how difficult it was for the French. You know, I mean, the, administering this, this mayhem of a colony was way tougher on the French than administering India was for the British. Um, the Vietnamese were troublemakers. They were always fighting. You know, the wealth isn't that easy to get to in Vietnam necessarily. But I think there were some really, really valuable things, rubber plantations. Indochina supplied the vast bulk of the world's rubber. Uh, Indochina supplied a huge portion of the world's rice. In other words, by the time that World War II had come around, it seemed as if France had kind of settled things down and were beginning to make a good show of it in Vietnam. And I think that they hoped that they would be able to continue to do that after the war. But that's that's an excellent question because it just... Um, you wonder, was it worth it? I mean, eight-year war that the French fought between 1946 and 1954? And, and the Americans saw them do it, you know? But they were French, and they were terrible, and they were fighting it, they were fighting it terribly, and they were inept. And there was, you know, the, the, we'll do it differently. We'll, you know, okay. Who else? Greg Yost, I'm, I'm sure you have something to say. Oh, yes. Thank you. First of all, the first thing I say is thank you for a great presentation. So if I say nothing else, I, I want to get that out. So thank you so much. Uh, the Machiavellian quote, I think, goes something like this. Keep your enemies close and your friends closer. So <laughs> you're more likely to be done in by your quote unquote friends than your yeah. enemies. <laughs> so, yep. Yep. So, uh, and then, of course, a, a confirmation or correction or whatever. Yes, Thomas Dewey was the Republican candidate, governor of New York, Republican candidate in 44. He did so well against FDR. He lost, but he did so well that they ran him again in 48. And then in 48, if we remember, he defeated Harry Truman. Right. We have the newspaper proof. That yes. Dewey, right. Dewey, 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 Dewey defeated Truman. So. Right. He had, had actually did win the election. So. So. So, uh, so Thomas Dewey was heavily favored to win in 48. Right. Heavily. It wasn't supposed right. to be even close, I believe. Right. Right. Well, the Gallup poll, they stopped polling like six weeks before the election. And Truman came on strong at the end. So that's where 
that's where and then history I'm, I'm i'm going off on a tangent i do have some vietnam related questions but okay if you remember uh dewey's running mate in 48 was earl warren the governor of california so if dewey had won the election earl warren never would have been on this u.s supreme court so how history changes so how interesting yeah. we're talking about this of course because peter dewey the first right right casualty, american casualty in vietnam was related to thomas dewey somehow Okay. Somehow. Okay. Yeah. So, so um, a couple of questions about Vietnam, and um, I put one in the chat. Did Chiang Kai Shek and the nationalist Chinese really want to get involved in Vietnam? I mean, they they were they they're, they were in as bad of a shape as France was. He might have said thanks, but no thanks. You know, when we get our stuff together, we'll go in. But he had to have not been too happy about being asked to go into Vietnam. Uh, no, he was. I, I, I think this was a Chiang Kai-shek initiative, I believe. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. It, I mean, and which goes to show, I think, um, how covetous, no, that's not quite the word, right word, how entitled, how entitled the Chinese historically have, have view themselves, they view themselves as entitled to Vietnam. Okay. That Vietnam is kind of the southernmost territory of China. They really view Vietnam as an extension of the Han Chinese. And um, and I think I think that fits very well with Chiang Kai-shek's nationalism. So I, I, I think he didn't see it as an occupation so much as, or he you know, didn't promote it so much as an occupation, as kind of like just visiting your cousins <laughs> <laughs> and taking everything that they owned <laughs> yeah. And then before you went back home. Yeah. But yeah, it was it's interesting because the 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 allies were kind of troubled by it. They were kind of troubled by it because there were so many troops there. And you would yeah, it, I, and I also think Greg and I could be wrong about this that the really terrible shape that the Chiang Kai-shek's army was in helped to encourage them to go into Vietnam and okay. maybe grab some rice. Okay. 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 Yeah. Now the the other question is that um you when we talk about the French in Vietnam, especially during this sort of post war era, you spend a lot of time talking about Vietnam, but the French, at least in theory, viewed it as French Indochina, which is Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. Are you in effect saying that Vietnam really was the crown jewel of this little empire in terms of economic production, rice, yes. coal, minerals? Laos and Cambodia were really second second players in this. Very much so. If they could yeah, have very played. much so. They yeah. were Laos and Cambodia were backwaters compared okay. to Vietnam. Vietnam was the first of the three, you know, and, and as we know that, and I'll emphasize it again, that the French did, they banned the use of the term Vietnam. They would never, right. ever refer to the Viet Minh as Viet Minh, Vietnamese, never refer to them as that. They referred to them as Cochin Chinese, Annamites, Tonkinese, Tonkin, Annam, Cochin China. That's how they broke up Vietnam. But Vietnam was really the the essence of that little collection there, as far as the French were concerned. Was the, absolutely the essence. Yeah. Yes. Thank yes. you. Yep. Yeah, you know, Rick, you're talking about Vietnamese money, Dong, Rick, and, and Ben. Um, one of our travelers said that AAA no longer deals in Vietnamese currency. Uh, I So I, I'm, I'm curious about that. I haven't given them a call yet about it. Um, and I don't know about Travel X. I guess it's still at the airport. Right. Okay. Any other comments or questions? I I thought that I would do this again next week, um, which will be November. No. Yeah. November. What's the date? Second? Yeah. November 2nd. November 2nd. I will be here. I'll do this again Thursday, November 2nd. Uh, and and kind of bring the story through the first Indochina War, and then at the end of the first Indochina War, the war is handed over essentially to the U.S. The U.S. takes the reins, and that's where we'll end it. Um, I do hope, and I I would uh, you know I I know that some of you are probably fairly well versed in the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, which ends the first Indochina War, and please do if you are uh, come prepared to. Tell us about it because I know you know the outlines of it, and I'll give the outlines of it. 
but uh, I'll be interested to hear. I know a lot of you will know many more details about that fascinating and world historical battle of Dien Bien Phu, which took place in March to May 1954, ending the first Indochina War. So we'll we'll talk about that, um, and I'll send out an email to remind you about it. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining us this evening. It's always a pleasure having this conversation. And I hope to see you on Monday night in our regular BBC happy hour. Good night, everybody.